doing this thing. You've been travelling Europe for how long now? Over a month. Over a month doing research on puppets. Puppets. Yeah. So nice to have you. Thank you for okay. being with us and tell us more. Okay. Anything you want to tell us? Okay. <laughs> I'll let everyone finish settling down. Although, uh, I suppose the big question, um, and, and it, it's been reflected in quite a few of my like initial comments on the subject. As soon as someone here seems to hear, I'm doing puppets, the next question out of their mouth is kind of like, why? And um, this, the, the whole lecture is kind of an answer to that question, which is why, why I've been sometimes a little cagey as to explaining it all, because I know I was going to explain it all here. So, but it is, uh, you have to admit, it is kind of an odd thing. There's several more seats up here. By way of preface, uh, we are going to watch a film called, the the actual name of the film in Czech is called uh, Rakvich Karna, which translates directly into The Coffin Factory. Although it's often called, when it, this appears on certain DVDs by Jan Schwankmeyer, it appears as Punch and Judy. Although, in fact, the characters in it aren't quite Punch or Judy. It, um, but nevertheless, it, it has that sort of thing. And one of the things I want you to see in watching this film is I have actually probably watched this film at least 50 times. Because in Alaska, every time there's anyone interested in puppetry, this is the film I show them to show them that puppets can do an awful lot more than you think. Now, I've watched it about 50 times. I've never remotely gotten tired of it. And there are things that keep me coming back over and over and asking, what is this really about? And, and if you know anything at all about Punch and Judy shows, you know there's a lot of smashing and bashing of puppets. And uh, Schwankmeyer uses this for, well, I'll let you come to your own conclusions as to what for. So, here we go, the coffin factory.
uh, which which begs the question, what in the world was that about? Which I'm not going to get into, just because it is what it is, and we could talk about it afterwards. But I just wanted to show you if you thought that was a simple something simple going on there. I don't think so. <laughs> and if, the only thing I would tell you about that to help you understand it a bit is that it was made in 1964 in the Czech Republic under the commun Czechoslovakia at the time under the communist uh, system. And so that is probably a key to begin to look at something like that. But there is an awful lot more going on than just that. So I wanted to show you that because that's a, a good introduction into puppetry. And in fact, is one of the first things I saw that was uh, kind of got me thinking like, hmm. At first it was just the films that interested me. And I thought, well, these are interesting films. I wonder if there are any more. But like most Americans, I started off with uh, my image of puppetry was something like uh, this. Are there Alphorns blowing? <laughs> um, this is my, and most Americans that I know, introduction to puppetry, the Muppets. And the Muppets, uh, I don't want to get into a diatribe about the Muppets at the moment, but the Muppets generally don't contain the same kinds of layers of depth that we just saw in that last film. Um, there are some more interesting pieces, uh, particularly in the earlier years. But like most Americans, these kind of cute, cuddly creatures is what I would think of as puppets. Puppets equal Muppets equals children. And so I always thought of uh, puppets as being a children's art, or maybe a folk art at best. But once I uh, discovered... Um, oh, by the way, King Kong was a puppet, the original King Kong. And a lot of the stop-motion animation was another way in which, as an American, I came across puppetry. Although, it didn't really occur to me until after I started studying puppetry. That, oh, if you go back and look at King Kong today, it's an amazing little puppet show. Particularly since now we have digital imagery. And there's something about the King Kong creation that looks so tactile versus digital variations on all of these things. Uh, it was the late 80s. Uh, the Film Forum in New York City was having a uh, festival where they were showing uh, films by Jan Schwenkmeyer. Schwenkmeyer is a Czech who, as I mentioned before, uh, grew up in communist times. He's about 78 years old right now. When I first saw these films, I started saying to myself, there's something more going on here. And he's made a variety of films. He's, he's recently made more full-length films that have... Uh, more live human beings in them uh, and such. Although the last film was called Surviving Life, which he made about two years ago, was featured mostly human beings as cutouts that he would animate. So in a sense, he turned the human being back into a, a puppet. And in a sense, he was making a comment on what's happening in the Czech Republic at the moment. That is to say that our consumerism is turning us back into puppets. And uh, although I don't think he'd say the message quite as baldly as I did, I'm pretty sure that was behind it. Films. Now, wh what's interesting is that was primarily live with bits of animation in it. And so you, that's one of the reasons I show it to people is because you really get a chance to see the puppets move around. What's also really interesting is that he, puts, he shows the hands going into the puppet, which immediately lets you know everything else you're about to watch is just hands in a puppet and, you know, a camera. So he's totally made it something that it's like he's defanged it, except it's just the opposite with puppetry. And that's the thing I began to discover over and over is you can tell people, you can stand next to the puppet, and eventually people will just be watching the puppet, not you, on a stage. But Schwankmeyer has a lot of imagery. This is from his Alice in Wonderland, and eventually the, uh, both... All three of those Alice's move in the picture. They, they are all Alice. The, the, the living one turns into the doll and wanders around for most of the film as a doll. But his films uh, are sometimes disturbing and always thought-provoking and very interesting. And as I was in New York City about to leave, I kept 
thinking, this is also from his Alice in Wonderland, and in this one, the, the rabbit is, it, the first thing it does is it loses sawdust. <laughs> it's got stuff with sawdust, so it's trying to sew itself up all the time. Uh, and it's actually, I am pretty sure that's a rabbit skin. And uh, he is not the only one to do that kind of thing in these films. And the eyeballs themselves are kind of disturbing because they look like they were borrowed from someone uh, who needed eyeballs. And he'll do things like that. That's the kind of, there's these odd juxtapositions of imagery. And yes, indeed, those are real scissors. Um, and, and that's one thing that got me thinking. And as I started thinking about it, I started saying to myself, maybe there's more going on here than just the films. Maybe it comes from a tradition. This is Schwenkmeyer himself a couple of years ago, basically the person I met on the trip. Um, I also, around the same time, ran into uh, the films of a couple of brothers. Uh, they're identical twins. They're known as the Brothers Quay. They're actually from Philadelphia. Huh. And, uh, but they've been living in London for ages. And uh, they're very inspired by Polish uh, film work. And uh, eventually they would go on to champion Jan Schwankmeyer and such. But they'd started doing these films before him. Their films also include... Uh, a lot of imagery that just really causes you to ask what it is you're watching and why does it have the effect on you that it does. And I think that their work is also uh, some of the most interesting and innovative puppet work. And again, with Jan Schwankmeyer, if you're going to watch it like a pleasant... like I know people who've picked up Jan Schwankmeyer's Alice thinking, I'm going to show this to the kids. And the kids are kind of going, hmm. And the parents are going, Hmm, because it's not the happy-go-lucky kind of Disney Alice in Wonderland, or it's not even a Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland. It's it's odd, really odd. You have bones moving around that he's animating and stuff, which is, you know, normally you don't show. But I I think actually probably kids like it. But uh, this is the brothers Quay here. Uh, this is actually them in the 1980s. They're about 65 now. And uh, they would animate these creatures and spend hours and hours and hours doing each frame. But of course, as you see, what they're really animating is a puppet. And I think one of the definitions of a puppet film, as I started to understand it, is a film in which you know this is a puppet. Just as the hands go into the, the puppets here, you know, you're never asked, you're never saying to yourself at one moment, this is a real creature. This is, it's not like digital imagery, where you're essentially asked to believe. So... Anyway, I then started to look into more puppet films and discovered the works of Yirzhi Trinka uh, in the Czech Republic, who comes before Schwenkmeyer. This one here is from 1964 as well. This, he was a very respected artist, uh, particularly of kids' uh, children's uh, movies, uh, with puppets, obviously. Uh, but this one was all about the role of the artist in, in uh, the communist world, although they didn't use communist imagery, it was quite clear. And the hand makes him do all these things. It keeps trying to make him, instead of he wants to make flower pots, it keeps trying to get him to make a hand. And everything is about these hands. He has to re reproduce the hand. And in the hand, end, the hand crushes him. And then he dies. And then he's celebrated as an artist who's a hero of the state. And these kinds of things, of course, did happen in uh, communist times. And of course, this was not a uh, very subtle metaphor. But he was older, he'd become super respected, and he just basically decided to crash his whole career with this movie. The, the version that is, la that is on a DVD has some kind of bad sound quality, and I'm convinced it's because there's only one copy of the film left, the one that was not in the country at the time, because the communists made sure every other one. And this next is a picture of Mr. Trinka. Again, not the kind of guy you expect to work with your children. <laughs> Another person, predating even Trinka, who was working in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, is Ladislaw Starovich, who was a uh, Polish-Russian uh, uh, director. And he was in Moscow in 1908. He made the first stop-motion animation films. He was also really interested in entomology and natural history. And so he made his first stop-motion animation films out of beetles. And one of the first films from, I think, 1911 is about the grasshopper and his wife. 
and it's all about the grasshopper's wife and the grass the grasshopper's wife is cheating on him with a beetle. So it's like, wait, this is not like a kid's story. I mean, and and in the end, the grasshopper gets revenge. He he has a camera and he films the beetle and the 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 female grasshopper together and and shows it to them in public and such. But it's just this crazy 1911 uh, Russia. So Starovich is really important. One of my favorite films. This one is from his uh, uh, Reynard the Wolf. I mean the Fox. But in uh, he did one in 1933 uh, called The Mascot in English, or Fetish in French. And it's an amazing film. It's like about 25 minutes long. And it's all about this, this stuffed dog that goes to try to find an orange to he- help its sick owner recover. And, and in the process, it ends up going through hell. And this, this satanic party and all this stuff, all hell breaks loose. And he, but he finally gets the orange back, cures the sick girl. It's like an amazing story. <laughs> but, and it's kind of a kid story, but the imagery in it is just wild, uh, as this is. And that's, this is Starovich himself, uh, looking a bit like a scientist almost. Um, so I was starting to watch these, and then it kept occurring to me, there's something in puppetry that I'm not getting, and I would like to get. And uh, so in 2000, I was passing through here, and on, on the way through, I went out further. I went to, I saw a puppet show in uh, Vienna. I saw one in Romania. And then I went to the Czech Republic, where I saw this, which is the Don Giovanni that is kind of perpetually there. There are actually two Don, Don Giovannis, but this is the official one at the National Marionette Theater. And it's very classic Czech puppetry, and it was... Uh, something that made me say, okay, this is really interesting. I also saw a couple of things that were more for tourists. But I said to myself, when I got back home, I said, hmm, I'm going to have to go back later and kind of look at this some more. And over, so over the next five years, I started to think about it. One of the things I also saw during that time were things like this. This is a uh, nativity scene. And in places like Poland, these things were animated the, the some of the figures on them actually moved and uh, were operated and so the, their and it turns out that the nativity play goes back into the church uh, quite a ways into the middle ages as a puppet show and this one here is actually a much more modern one uh, I actually just saw these puppets in the uh, flesh so to speak well in the wood uh, in Vienna they're in a, the theater museum there and they're by a uh, Richard Teschner, and Teschner uh, would, would always do these uh, nativity plays once a year. In fact, they're reproducing them this year. There's a Teschner scholar who's going to do a whole series of them through no, uh, December. So if I were in Vienna in December, you'd know where to find me. But uh, So there is a long tradition of these uh, nativity plays in European puppetry, which I just find interesting. Around 2004, this was actually my first attempt at a puppet show here. And this is, uh, uh, it, it was the attack of the 50-foot woman. And we used this kind of thing. And then we had a full-size human being behind the screen. So it was kind of a shadow play. But it wasn't particularly exciting. But nevertheless, uh, a group of friends enjoyed it. But I came back here in 2005. And after I was done at Labrie, I decided to take two months or so to go around to different puppet theaters in Europe. I'd kind of arranged this all ahead of time. And what I really wanted to do was interview and talk with people about puppetry. So one of the first places I went was to uh, this theater in uh, Parc du de Chaumont in uh, Paris. And they have the Guignol show. And Guignol is this little character. This is the guy I met, uh, Pascal. And it's this trip that I took that really kind of upped my game, you know, so that I really started to understand puppetry a lot more. Uh, he would ring this bell, but this is, he's the guignolist, and he, uh, there's set quite a few different ones of these in Paris, and also Lyon has a, quite a tradition of these, but they're slightly different, and I look forward to seeing the ones in Lyon soon. But nevertheless, uh, the show comes on, and Guignol is the character over there who's based upon a, uh, silk weaver in Lyon, because Lyon used to be the silk capital of Europe. 
And, uh, but he's kind of a rascally character. And what happens is, now, you know, these shows are done for children. And at one, one of the stock characters in these is uh, the gendarme. And the gendarme at one point gets eaten by a crocodile. So, okay, well, that's kind of sad. And then Guignol decides to go fishing. And just as he reels his line in, the crocodile's snout comes up from behind him. And at that point, the kids kind of go insane. Unfortunately, I don't have the crocodile snout in here. And they start, like, pointing up, and they say, you know, you know, watch out, you know, there's, there's a crocodile behind you. And he looks, and of course, the crocodile's not there. And then he goes back, and then they see the snout again, and they just go insane. I was, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's this whole thing about interactivity, <laughs> the web and everything, and it's just like, you know, computer stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is interactivity. Because this is like, and, and I went on to ask him, uh, I said, one of the questions I asked is I said, this is back in the studio and some of the figures that were there, I asked him, do you think children have changed over the years with all the computers and screens and all the video games and stuff? And he goes, absolutely. And I said, well, do you think puppets still work? Does Guignol still work for children? He goes, more than ever. I said, Why? He says, well, he says, when they first come, he says, I can always tell the kids who've never been here before, because the guignol stage is not much bigger than some of our big television screens. And they want to somehow control it, but you know, there's nothing to pass. <laughs> and in fact, the puppet can talk to them. And in fact, the puppet does talk to them. And in fact, sometimes he would use the puppet to, like if there was a kid being rowdy, the puppet would say something to him. So it was actually communicating directly to the children. And so, in a sense, I saw this kind of reality principle here, that one of the interesting things about puppets, a real puppet show is kind of like intimate, it's small. They're usually small. I, I have a whole thought about large puppets and spectacle and such, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But, um, but usually a, a puppet show small might take place on a you know, stage like back there, and you wouldn't want many more people than you could fit into this building in, involved. Maybe half of them even would be better. So they could all see what was going on. So in other words, it's a small, intimate affair. And there's a sense of like, you know, you can just touch that thing. And of course, that's exactly what the kids want to do. Is they like, you know, and they jump up. So that was like the first thing that I saw that really sparked a new thought in me. And uh, Guignol just celebrated uh, 200 years uh, back in 2008. Um, and Guignol turns out to be a relative of a large tribe of puppets. And what it is is that pretty much every, uh, almost every country in Europe, Switzerland being an exception, <coughs> has a specific puppet for their country that's kind of a rascally character. The reason Switzerland probably doesn't is because linguistically it's divided up in three, so the Germans probably get Caspero, and the French probably get Guignol, and the Italians probably get you know, uh, Punchinello or something like that. Punchinello is the original. He was a Commedia dell'arte stock mask <coughs> character often seen in carnival time in Europe. And there's a whole series of these stock characters. Uh, and But Punch... The English Punch, who is actually, I hate to say it, much more important than Judy, who usually gets killed in these affairs. And one of the things about Punch is the most insane out of all of them, which may have something to do with the English kind of you know, like calm, steady sort of demeanor about themselves, at least traditionally, you know, prior to <laughs> soccer and all, you know, all the rest of that. But, you know, the English have always had sort of a you know, tamp down. And, but punch does everything you're not supposed to do. So in a punch show, you have, um, what is it? It's like punch kind of like is told to watch the baby, but the baby is crying. And finally, he just kills the baby. And then the wife, Judy, comes back and it's like, well, what happened to uh, the baby? And he's like, mm, he's dead. <laughs> you know, and then he ends up killing her. And then he ends up getting arrested by a policeman, but he probably kills a policeman. And then he gets put, sometimes he kills the executioner, sometimes he goes to hell and kills the devil. Punch is, in a, short, in a sense, a badass. By the way, this, <laughs> this uh, dog is part of the traditional punch show, and the dog is always called Toby. Toby's whole job is to sit on the edge of the little proscenium and do nothing. While 
all this mayhem breaks out on the stage, which is really funny. And you can see what Schrankmeyer did in his little movie that Toby was the, uh, the guinea pig. Was that a guinea pig or a hamster? I think. I always thought it was. But you never know, these little chinchilla type things. So, uh, but, so Punch, and that, what's interesting is, look at Punch, though, from a different perspective. You're like lower class. You haven't got a lot of entertainment. You go to this thing, you're, and you know there's people kind of pressing on you from all sorts of ways. But you can't react to it. You can't react to you know the different rules of your society. You know your wife nags at you, but you really can't do anything about it. You know your baby is screaming, but you really can't do anything about it. You know the police are after you, but you really can't do anything about it. You know, but punch does it all. So it's this very interesting social mechanism. By the way, I once did a Punch and Judy show in Alaska as part of the stuff that I ended up doing the only time I ever got really in trouble with people watching it. <laughs> Which I thought was great, because it was like the most traditional. I, I still laugh about that today. It's like we did the absolutely most traditional puppet show, and people were like, this is not politically correct. To which the answer is, I think that's the point. <laughs> so... Uh, but every, every uh, there's lots of these characters. They, they are different degrees. This is uh, Kasparek from uh, the Czech Republic. So is the next one. That's the Jan Schwenkmeier's Kasparek from his uh, Don Juan uh, puppet film. But uh, actually, the punch in the other one was actually kind of a Kasparek, too. And the other one, the figure in, in the, the coffin factory, was... Um, kind of a Paiachi uh, character, or Harlequin uh, as a, a, a character from uh, the Commedia dell'arte. So this is Petrushka in Russia. The, the Greeks and the Turks have one that's kind of Karagoyz, or Karagoyz, I'm not sure how it's exactly pronounced. Um, but there's like uh, Jan Cheese or something like that, and there's uh, Hans Wurst, and there's Kasparov, and there's, I mean, there's so many of these different guys uh, in different countries. So um, it's an interesting thing, and it's definitely here, you see something absolutely, you know, like the puppets can be used in the, for the nativity plays, they, they're passion plays with puppets and such, but here you have the archetype of just the opposite. It's like, this is your extremely profane character. But nevertheless, I think he serves a very interesting function in uh, the world. My next stop on this trip was to Charleville Mezières in France, where I went to the Cole Nationale Supérieure des Arts de la Marionette, which is kind of inside out, nicknamed Esnam. I always thought it should be Ensam. Or anyway, in Charleville Mezières, there are several things going on at once. One, it's the headquarters for the uh, international org organization for puppetry called Unima. Also, the word marionette in French, marionette means all puppets. Unlike in English, the word marionette means just stringed puppets. Um, and also, it's the International Institute of Marionettes, and the school is related to it. The school's really interesting. They only take 15 students every three years. They pay for everything for them, of course, except for the tryouts. You've got to get there yourself. What's interesting, though, is you don't actually have to have gone to college or anything. What you have to do is prove you've had some puppetry experience speak French, and perform on the spot something they give you, you know, they give you like a day or so to come up with something, giving you some sort of thing to do. So those are the three requirements. And the, and the 15 people who uh, do that end up going to the school for three years through a course of programs. And I, when I came here, I didn't know what to expect, really. But what I saw just completely redefined everything I thought about puppetry. And one of the things, this particular girl, Yulia Kovac, was from uh, Hungary. And she did this story where she started off, she was standing way at the end of this hall. And she had this like bag with her. And she started saying these words in French about where does war come from? Uh, you know, why is there bloodshed? These kinds of things. <coughs> asking these kind of deeper philosophical questions. And then what she does is she comes forward and places these kind of broken marionettes on pedestals, and finally ends up with these two, a man and a woman, obviously unfinished. And they start having this discussion, and the woman starts saying something like this. You know, I'm really afraid. It just seems like there's so much war and violence in the world, and I just don't know what to do about it. It just doesn't seem right. 
And the man says, you know, you're right. It isn't a good thing. And basically, you know, but this is the world we find ourselves living in and we have to get used to it. And the woman says, yeah, but it's really not right. I mean, it just seems just completely wrong. And the guy goes, I know it's not right, but basically you're going to have to just get used to it. This is the way the world goes. And then finally she says, but I'm really afraid. And, to, and, and it ends with the two of them like this. The woman is crouching and the other puppet, I wish I'd gotten that image. The other puppet is crouching over her, about to beat her. And then she stops and she goes, where does war come from? And where does bloodshed come from? And in a sense, she brings it right back to us. Now, I saw this twice. I wanted to kind of record it on this audio recorder that I had. But I was just like so taken in by it that I couldn't even remember to turn on the thing. And it was just this, her standing there the whole time with this. I got her to do this afterwards. Uh, uh, the, uh, but it, it was just... Uh, very powerful uh, piece, uh, which showed me that at that point I thought puppets can do pretty much anything. Uh, maybe they can't do the psychological realism that actors can do, but as far as getting across any sort of idea, they aren't just for children. And that became really clear to me. This was another show that I saw, and this was an, a R Romanian girl named Aurelia Ivan, who's now in Paris, and I'm going to see her again. Those Things on the floor there are actually little walnuts, and she's reading off of this list of the attributes of a great, uh, you know, knight of France, Jean de Sagesse, and Jean this and Jean that. But finally, he's Jean Le More, Jean the Dead. And then she starts taking out these little, and what they actually are is grape vines that have been trimmed. But they, she makes them into roots, and each one has a face. And as she's pulling them out. She does each voice with them, and they're putting them into the ground, and each voice is saying, oh, this feels so good, and, and there's a little baby one that says, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, and what they're doing is eating John the Dead. And essentially, the whole thing is a treatise on the nature of death and such. I mean, philosophically, it's not from my position, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was quite interesting. Um, the, and, the, and she did things like, she had like lights on the end of her wrists, and she made these great branches grow, but just the shadows. So you got the idea of it's gross. And the last thing she did is as, as you left, she handed you a walnut. And it really made you, it was kind of like I said, I didn't particularly philosophically agree with the whole thing, but I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. She's actually doing a show now uh, about, the, about people becoming androids. So she's made a full-sized Android uh, kind of armature and everything, but it is, has left it kind of blank and empty. But she made a life mask of her own face to put on it, and and it's really a comment on where we're going. So and that's another thing I started to learn. And uh, she introduced me to this guy who was standing around afterwards with her. This guy named uh, Francois Lazaro. He used to be a teacher there. I couldn't actually interview any of the teachers while I was there because they were actually grading these student performances and so it wasn't a good time. But he had been a, one of the professors there and he was also had been doing uh, things uh, since the early 70s. And so I had a very interesting discussion with him as well. And again, as I'm processing this, I'm saying to myself, this is really fascinating. It's just like, this is an art form that really can go all over the place. And I don't think most people understand this. So um, I moved on from there to Germany, uh, where I went to Berlin. I was actually visiting a friend, but there were several puppet theaters in Berlin. And I went to this one, the, could you pronounce this for us? Thank you. <laughs> the Shadow Theater. Uh, but, uh, but it's the figure circle or the figuren circle. You know, is that close enough? So, <laughs> but the, the interesting thing, now this is the only image I have of what it looks like from the front when you're watching it. And in fact, it's in a circle, which was actually after this guy Richard Teschner in Austria had also worked with a circle, except he worked with three-dimensional puppets. But these were all shadow puppets. Now what's fascinating is I was pretty convinced there were two or three people behind there. But it was only this one Austrian guy named Georg Jensch. And... I went and talked to him, and he showed me essentially how he did it. He even had one shadow puppet that was a, not a shadow puppet, it was a light puppet. And what he did was he had like a piece of, instead of the black uh, stuff, he had a piece of uh, 
like like reflective silver stuff that he would shine a light on it and get it. It was an angel that would fly. So you know, just uh, also as you can see, there's just this whole thing with very fascinating just a use of imagination. I was, that's one of the things that was always striking me. It's just like endless, endless variations on things nobody's ever thought about, it seems. You know, these, these kinds of, uh, you know, how to use imagery. I also went to this theater, Di Shao Buddha, which is like a repertory theater, as it says on top, for puppet, puppets, figures, and object theater. And I went back there again this time. But at that point, there was a, a group that was doing, uh, actually, this was one of the funniest things ever. It finally proved to me once and for all that Germans have a sense of humor. Because <laughs> it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I, 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 I mean, it, just as a puppet show or anything, I was just like, I didn't even understand German. My friend would occasionally, but I didn't need to. They were so funny. This, this woman over here, every time she'd hear bad news, she'd be like, oh, you know. Um, but they were really fascinated. It was uh, Ingrid and uh, Torsten, and they w were both doing this back in the communist times in East Berlin. And this is when I started, in a sense, I had crossed the border into where I was really trying to get to, which was what, w what had been going on back in the day in communist days with puppetry, because I knew from Schwankmeyer that the, the puppets were communicating communicating an awful lot more than just a little simple uh, morality tale or a story for children or something like that. And what they told me is that during the communist times, people would fill these theaters because they, and they would look and they would watch. Sometimes they would read too much into what they were watching. But uh, sometimes, what, what they sometimes did is they would submit uh, their scripts, but then they would change the images. So one really particularly bold move, they had the uh, like winter uniform of the Stasi or something like that uh, as part of their characters, which immediately was like everyone in the audience got it, but it was still like, whoa, are we really doing this? This was near the end of the, uh, the communist era. So from them, I really learned you know, what it was like. Now, of course, there was an interesting thing that happened as soon as the wall came down, suddenly all the American movies and all the American uh, music, everything just flooded in. And there was a period where it's like, yeah, who needs puppets? You know, we can go and watch Lord of the Rings now. You know, it's like, whoa, who, this is all big stuff. And in fact, you go across Europe today, and everywhere you go, there's huge, m amazing, you know, digital, blasting epics, that, the same kind of things you'd see in America, exactly the same kind of things. In fact, the same things. So, but I went from there to Poland. I had trouble finding a puppet theater in Poland because I was looking for, you know, when you think puppet theater, you think of something kind of small. And this is generally what puppet theaters in Poland look like. Because the Russians came in and told them the following thing after World War II. There are four types of culture. You must have these. One, ballet. Two, opera. Three, theater. And for the children and other people, puppets. And so the flip side of this one is the theater, and then there's two more, and that's the huge uh, Stalinist Gothic monument in the middle of Warsaw. But essentially, that's what puppet... I mean, every puppet theater I have seen in Poland looks like a bank. It just is this massive building. It's like a state... Uh, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, the courthouse or something. It's just amazing. I went to one called the Teatra Grotesca in... Uh, Krakow, where they had these strange, dark puppets. And they were actually on the end of actors' hands. And the actors would sometimes be themselves and sometimes be the puppets. It was a really fascinating show. But look how these are made with, like, burlap and the textures. And another thing I'd like to point out is if you remember back to the Schwenkmeyer film, think of all the textures in there. And you could practically touch that film. It just, just, and, and it is, that's one of the things that keeps you watching it over and over uh, apart from trying to figure out what he's actually saying, it's just the density, the layers of textures in that are so incredible. And Schwenkmeyer and many of these people have thoughts about the tactility of puppets, how they should be something you should touch, in fact. You know, not only the puppeteers, but sometimes they'll, like uh, the group I saw in the Czech Republic, Buktia Lotki, which means cakes and puppets, let people come up afterwards and play with the puppets and touch them. So, uh, 
From here, I went, uh, this was actually in the backstage. Uh, th this is one of the closets where they store things. One of the, th the principles I learned is if there's any way to get yourself in the, uh, the warehouse where they keep all the old puppets, go. Because that's where, like, there's tons of interesting stuff there. But again, this is obviously not, this is not the kind of puppet show you'd say, come on, we're going to the puppet show. You know, <laughs> this is obviously something serious going on here. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that Krakow isn't that far from Auschwitz either. So it's kind of like these very, I mean, they kind of look like nice puppets, except what's that one over there? Doesn't it like, like some sort of bruised puppet? And um, it's just a very, there's a lot going on with these images. This was the director, Adam Veltchek, of the, uh, the Teatro Grotesca. And I talked to him, and I said at one point, because I'd been talking with these Germans, so I said, so let me guess, you... <laughs> You, you handed in, the, in Poland, the censors are really strict. And he says, you handed it in, and then they hand you, you'd hand in the script, but then they, they'd hand it back to you, and they really didn't understand the imagery, and so you would just kind of change the imagery, and he goes like, yeah. <laughs> you know, just kind of like, of course we did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just, it's almost like it became a game. I actually was talking to one of the people, actually this, this thought surfaced several times, why was that such a fruitful time? And the, and the reason is, is because they had something to kick against. That, you know, uh, so much, I think our art kind of fails because we don't have any direction for it. And at this point, they really had a direction for it. And so they really had to become good to get across whatever they were trying to get across in this kind of very clamped down situation. This is a, uh, a picture, this is a... Uh, uh, Don Giovanni, no, no, uh, sorry, this is a Faust from uh, the uh, Puppet Museum in Hrudim in the Czech Republic. But of course, this is the CSSR, the Czechoslovakian Socialist Republic. And this was like a postcard that they were trying desperately to get rid of because, uh, you know, obviously they are no longer the Socialist Republic. But um, this museum was really fascinating. And I also spoke with the museum director. <laughs> who gave me, uh, her name was Alina Exnerova, she gave me a complete like history and a book to go with it. I started getting books from people after a while. This happened on this trip too, that it got so heavy that I just was, I mean, I just was given a book this thick and this wide, autographed by the author, you know, back in Warsaw, and I was like, okay, thank you, and I was like, oh, I'm so happy, and my back was just, oh. So I had to mail that back and spend uh, uh, basically the equivalent of $70 to mail it back. But uh, she gave me a whole history of the uh, puppetry in the Czech Republic. He took me around, the, this guy's named Radek, uh, took me around, uh, showed me the back rooms and such. Of, of the, uh, and what the, the picture that started to come to me about puppetry in the Czech Republic is they started to with the uh, nativity plays and miracle plays as puppetry. Uh, eventually, though, uh, they got the, the people who really brought puppetry to them were the English and the Dutch and the Germans. And the English were doing things like short versions of Shakespeare plays. They did Macbeth, and they did Hamlet, and they did uh, some other plays. So these were done, though, in, in kind of shortened versions in Czech. Now, what happened in 1620 is the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire finally said what, what had really happened was the Czech Republic had revived their Jan Hus early Protestantism. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire said, enough of this. And finally, in 1620, you had this, the, it's called the Battle of White Mountain, totally crushed the Czech rulers. And then Czech was banned. And only German was allowed in all forms of education. And so you couldn't, you couldn't use uh, Czech in you know, any kind of education, any kind of public thing. It was only German, which is why Franz Kafka, a Czech, writes in German because it, that tradition kept on for a long time. But puppet shows, for instance, were done in Czech, because they were kind of like below the line. It wasn't the only thing that kept the language alive. There were quite a few things. But, but it was certainly one of the things, one of many things. Later, the Kasparek character, who's kind of this you know, uh, uh, rascally Punch-like character, but not quite as sinister as Punch, would often be saying things about the Austro-Hungarians, you know, uh, you know, about the Habsburgs. 
And so it was kind of like these coded messages were slipped through. Later, uh, <laughs> there was like a whole thing during the Nazi era where puppeteers were actually doing these shows that were getting them in trouble. Um, one guy, uh, Jan Malik, uh, who was a great puppeteer, it, it documents that over 100 puppeteers were killed by the Nazis. And in fact, including the greatest one, had his puppets actually arrested. <laughs> because they were so worried about what these puppets symbolized for the Czechs. It's the only place in the world probably where puppets have taken on this really heroic kind of cast. And then later during the communist period, all these messages were smuggled through with puppetry as well. So um, I moved on from there. Oh, this is uh, one of the, uh, the skeletons in the uh, Czech puppet museum. And skeletons show up all the time in Czech art. And uh, the way it's explained to me is this, is that skeletons don't simply mean death. Whenever you see a skeleton in Czech art, it also is a warning. And it says, think about how you live, because eventually you will be me. So it has this meaning. It's like when you see a skeleton, it's like, think about it. How are you living? And that's kind of what the skeleton means. So it's not just a, a symbol of horror. It's also a symbol of, of questioning. So you see the skeletal image over and over. The next place I went to was this theater called Drac, which is, means dragon, but... It also has a longer, uh, it's an acronym in, in Czech. Uh, I've heard it as Theater of Love and Joy, but it, there's another one that's probably closer to the heart of it. And uh, this, for instance, is from their, uh, just some older puppets from their uh, show of the Pied Piper of Hamelin, which they call Krizarsh. And, uh, and I never really saw the Pied Piper as kind of a, a good figure before until I saw this one Czech puppet movie about it, where you suddenly realize, oh, he's come to save them from the rats, and they're greedy and won't pay him. So finally, in the end, he takes the children. And in some versions of the story, he just takes them away, because essentially the people aren't worthy of it, because they, they have no gratitude in their hearts for anyone. So it's, it's an interesting... It, it, and a lot of these old stories, like Don Juan or Don Giovanni, Faust... Um, uh, the Pied Piper of Hamlin make amazing puppet stories because they, they lend themselves to all sorts of meta, meta, uh, metaphorical reinterpretations and stuff. This was Jakob Krafta, whom I again met on this time. He was the director of Drac at the time. His father, uh, Josef Krafta, actually started the thing. This is actually a puppet that, as a full-size puppet that someone was dancing with that represents uh, the Habsburg Empire. And, oh, how did he get there? Actually, I was traveling with them for one of their shows. On this, It was probably the scariest auto trip I have ever, ever had in my life. I was in their van traveling with them. And the Czech roads, later I found a book saying, indeed, the Czechs have the worst driving statistics in Europe because of all the beer and the weird narrow roads. And the fact that if, like, I saw the following when I was traveling with these guys. A car came from about three or four cars behind us, passed four or five cars in front of us as a semi-truck was coming straight there and only at the last possible second we go, and there's no room to pull off. And I was just like, ah. Anyway, that's just uh, the kind of trip it was. But these guys were great. And I actually met this guy, Philip, again. Uh, when I, uh, He was there and some other, some other people who were involved with this. I saw them when I was just back there. And they were like, you remember us? And I go like, how can I forget? But uh, they would also do these things that are kind of like combining mime, circus, puppetry, all sorts of stuff like that. But finally I got back to Prague, and Prague being kind of like the central, uh, there's an awful lot of puppet stuff going on in Prague, including occasionally uh, you'll find a store like this that has really, really good, and, uh, and here's the way you know how, expensive puppets. These, because they're, done, they're carved by real artists who do puppets. And, uh, but they also have tons of cheap imitation puppets like these. These are like, you know, pick one of these up for $30 or so. And, but they're, these are just, they're not meant to be good puppets. And in fact, most of these are run by Bulgarians and Serbians and stuff who came in to kind of cash in on, uh, including this one. This is the fake Don Giovanni. The most interesting part of it is the outdoor awning there, you know, but the carvings outside. The actual puppets are not that interesting. They also have a lot of these black light theaters, which occasionally use puppetry as well. Uh, they're often done for tourists. But 
This is uh, Lotkash magazine, which is the oldest puppetry magazine in the world. It just this year it turned 100. And uh, they uh, kind of track puppetry in the Czech Republic and in other countries as well, but primarily in the Czech Republic. And this was the group, Bukti Aloki, that I saw that really just completely changed my whole uh, vision of puppetry once again. I'd, I'd seen all this other stuff and I was quite impressed, but these guys really was like, whoa, where is this coming from? And, and this version is Baskervilskis, uh, Pez Baskervilskis, which means the Hound of the Baskervilles. And... Um, this was their version of that story. And in fact, they did things like, this is where they go crazy. They had a version of Rocky, the movie, called Rocky Nine. Uh, I, while I was there, I watched Psycho Reloaded, which was their version of the Alfred Hitchcock movie Psycho. The one I'm really regretting that I'm missing is the one called Lynch, which is based on the works of David Lynch. I would love to have seen what on earth they did with that. I also saw recently their... their uh, King Arthur variation, and all of these things are just completely mind-boggling. These are the uh, the people involved, and uh, this is how they set things up. So it looks like they just drag some stuff out of the backyard, particularly in this one, and uh, you'll notice some blood stains on there because they they kill one of the characters and have uh, stage blood run off of every show, and they just leave it there. But let me show you something here. So up here is a stage. Right here is a stage. Right here is a stage. Sometimes these are used for shadows. They also have live musicians playing in the back. And but So in this particular one, a little puppet walks out onto this little stage. There's a little bed there. And he's got a little bottle in his hand. He drinks and he falls asleep. And the rest is his dream. I was just like... <laughs> Okay, you got me. This is just like incredible. So this is where most of the action will t take place. But sometimes, like there's one point where someone passes someone a gun. You see two human hands. One passes a gun to, over to someone else here. In this, this is like for close-ups. So what they've done is they've taken movie kind of techniques and applied them to puppetry. And in fact, when I ask them, who's your main influence? They all say the same thing. Schwenkmeier. So they are the first like post-Schwenkmeier puppet troupe. So there you go. This is like the bleeding stage. Uh, and, and if you look at it, it's just completely funky. But that's what makes this really work. It's it's so funky that it really, I mean, look, they just drag this out of like someone's backyard, or, you know, some industrial waste product. Um, or this one where the, what was great about this is this is a mermaid. So they're putting her in. This is before the show. Later, they fill it with water and they blow through a clear tube behind her. And so when she's talking, you see bubbles coming out. And, and what I said to them uh, this time, I got to know them a lot better this time, as I said, it's like you guys have figured out how to make amazing works of imagination for absolutely no money. And they said, that's the way it works. That's what it's all about. But they have this whole thing, and of course, you see the textures. See the, uh, And these guys really are working against the modern, shiny, mall aesthetic. You know, it's just like the, the really cool, chic way people are supposed to act and dress. These guys are just completely the opposite. They are funky, low down. Their stuff is just, it's very funny sometimes, but it's also, it really makes interesting points at others. Um, they're, they're quite... Unusual. The last place I went on my trip was to Salzburg, Austria, and saw the Marionette Theater there. And the Marionette Theater, this is actually from their museum. I didn't actually take any pictures during the production because I didn't feel like I had the permission to. But there's like nine strings on each of their marionettes. Some of these have less. I did see this. This was the Nutcracker, which I saw on May 1st. Someone will have to explain to me how that works in Europe someday. But... Uh, I, I always thought of this more of a Christmas thing myself. But anyway, I saw this on May 1st. and um, the But all of these crazy things that uh, were happening, this was uh, one of the characters also in the Nutcracker. And there, most of the human puppets have nine strings. These are like, learning these kinds of puppets is like learning the piano. It is so complex and so uh, hard to learn. I mean, you can, anyone, I've, I've got a puppet with nine strings at home. It's a bit clunkier as in design than these. But it's still, it takes a long time to learn it. And 
these people really have their technique down. Now the thing is, they do these things, this is also from the museum, they do them to pre-recorded opera. So I was watching The Nutcracker, they've also done most of Mozart's opera repertoire, and uh, they do other things as well. I, I highly recommend them. But I'd seen all of these things, and the thing that the Buktialoki people, the Cakes and Puppet people in Prague convinced me of is, we can do this back in Alaska. We got lots of stuff hanging around, and people with way too much time sometimes. Let's go, I'm going to go back and get some people to do this. So that's exactly what I did. We went back and, uh, and these are just some of the posters, which don't necessarily reflect the puppets. Uh, but this is the building we did a lot of our shows in. It was just this old log cabin. And what I decided is I couldn't just simply do the European style show. I had to have some sort of framework for it that would get people's attention. So what I did was I, I called it the Lilliputian Puppet Sideshow. And so you walk into a room, maybe half this big, and there's these cages all around you. And I would have each person make their own sideshow attraction. And then we'd have one MC, who, Master of Ceremonies, who would you know, uh, introduce each act. And we might have 10, 15 acts, depending on the year, depending on the show. And what was great is, we were always throwing people off. But it was all done kind of in the Bukti Aloki style. Everyone that was in my puppet thing just went through what you just went through. And in order to start, you had to be indoctrinated into puppetry. But, uh, and, but the, and there was a lot more that they got as well. But one of the things I was really convinced of is that we needed live music. So uh, this guy was hanging around in the back. He's actually our town doctor. He's my doctor. Uh, he, he's educated at Johns Hopkins University. If you know anything about American medicine, you know that's pretty much the best university. But anyway, he also likes the accordion, and I have this weird, funky instrument that he was able to play. When people would walk in, they would see this kind of stuff uh, hanging around on the sides of the walls. Which and your weight, you, we kind of funnel people in in the, all these blankets and stuff, so they didn't wouldn't know where they were. The musician was not readily available like that; he was just kind of off on the side. And so people would come in and, and they would end up sitting. Actually, what these people are looking at is something that's happening outside of one of the windows. We suddenly opened one of the windows and things were happening outside, and then closed it again. <laughs> so, but they never knew where to turn or where to look. And so uh, the, this is something that one of our other puppeteers made. Uh, that's something a friend of mine, Karsten, made. His sister was actually at Labrie back in Malay back in 1993. But he kind of got the idea. And so he, he was really fascinated by shadow puppets. So I let him do that. This is something I did as I found these dried salmon heads. And then I painted them and made a two-headed salmon creature with fur. Um, it was called the Serpentine Bicephalus. This is, someone else did this one, uh, and it was all about the kind of the bizarreness of fashion and such. And so this little puppet, obviously it's a doll that's been mm, reconfigured, Buktialotki style. Uh, but then all the little stuff, you know, miniature magazines and things, it's just brilliant. Uh, this one is great. Another guy, Gene, came up with this idea. Is these are, of course, can-can dancers. And what hot tomatoes they are. <laughs> this one, essentially, it's uh, aluminum foil, a little bit of clay, and, I don't know, are those marbles in the eyes? <laughs> it was an alien. This is one I did, uh, and uh, this one was a little bit more serious. This one was done during a November show, so it wasn't... Uh, but it had to do with the reflection in the mirror and stuff like that. At this point, this was a few years later, I was like, okay, we can push it and get more serious now. Now that they've got the basic concept, Puppets Not For Kids, this was another one of mine as well. And uh, kind of based on the Rapunzel story. Although in this version, it's a comedy. I did another one that, where it wasn't quite as comic. And this was one of mine, too. It was a mud puppet. And uh, it comes out of the mud. This is not the actual setting of it, but this is just hanging up. And I took a photo of it because I was too busy getting muddy to actually take photos of it at the time. So that gave you an idea of the kind of things we did with the Lilliputian Puppet Sideshow. But I was getting a little bit... Uh, it's kind of like that was almost getting too easy for me. So, and I noticed also most of the people that I had brought on board kind of were of a certain mindset. I think they wanted to do more funny things. It's one of the temptations with puppetry. I wanted to do things. I didn't. I you know, don't mind funny things, but I wanted to do things that were also pushing the limits of the form a bit more. 
So we divided up at this point, and they became the Geppetto's junkyard. And I became, along with my friend Karsten and some other people, Reckoning Motions. And so in this case, this was specifically a Christian show. But uh, every now and then I'll, I'll meet someone who's a Christian, and I say, say I do puppets, and they'll go like, oh, really, do you have a puppet ministry? And the answer is, no, I don't. Uh, I don't look at it that way at all. I look at it as art. I look at it as communication. I look at it as something that people haven't seen before. So we took this show and went for two months. I got a grant, and we went for two months around America with it. And we went, this Watson Lake is a small native village in uh, Yukon Territories in Canada. We went to a rock club in New York. We went to a uh, fundamentalist high school in Florida. We went to an anarchist art collective in Oakland, California. We played in uh, someone's backyard in Dallas. We played in a living room for Reed students in Oregon. We played at a classical uh, Christian academy in Minnesota. We played at a, uh, in a coffee shop with a drive-in window in South Carolina. Uh, so anyway, we played in all sorts of bizarre places. We had as many as 600 people at one of our shows as little as two in another. So, and, but the thing, we didn't make any money on this show, but what I learned was that what we were doing was something that communicated. And people would come up to us and they would say, uh, I've never seen anything like this before. So we basically drove around in this uh, van and uh, we made our stuff. That's, uh, it, the story was based, it was called The Great Ziggurat, which is based on the Tower of Babel. And we did the whole, we did the original story, but we did various towers through history. So one tower is kind of like the Middle Ages. One was the Roman era, one was the Middle Ages, one was the modern period, one was, the final one was uh, the postmodern era in which we used tinker toys to express the flimsiness of the tower we are now constructing. But uh, this was actually a puppet I had uh, commissioned for the project. Since I'd gotten this grant, I had a Czech carver make one and send it to me. And I'm actually going to meet her on this trip. And I based it on the actual historical character responsible for the great ziggurat, who is Sargon. Is He's called, in some places, the same character that most people believe is Nimrod. And uh, there's a mask of Sargon. And so I gave her uh, photos of the mask, and I said, and I want those blank eyes like the mask, you know. Um, so, but, and if you go to uh, Iraq today, chances are not many of you are going there recently, in the near future, but if you were to, if you go to the old side of Babylon, right next to the, is something that looks like a mountain, but it's not. It's the Great Ziggurat. It's the bottom part of it. So it's very interesting. But we also did things, we used all sorts of tower, uh, imagery from other things like Rapunzel uh, you know, climbing up the hair or uh, the movie Vertigo, uh, Jimmy Stewart pushing Kim Novak out the window or King Kong all showed up at different times. We had the, just uh, uh, lots of stuff going on. These were some of the puppets we had. Uh, you'll notice the one over in the corner near the big red fist, which did represent communism, was actually a Justin Timberlake action figure that we turned into Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> the next one next to it was the Hitler figure that was some sort of swashbuckling character from an action thing. And then that's Jimmy Stewart and Kim Novak. Uh, that's a DNA coil there. Uh, that cross kind of represented originally, the first part of the cross represented like the old Christianity, but then it eventually gets put on top of a, this kind of shinier thing to represent medieval Christianity, and it turns into this like golden cross. Uh, that's like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the actual action figure over there, who does show up in it. Um, <laughs> so we just threw stuff out. We also had, for instance, at one point we had a dialogue between Edgar Allan Poe and Carl Gustav Jung. Um, I had people coming up, and some guy goes, oh, was that Faulkner? And they go, no, no, that was Edgar Allan Poe. And he turns to the guy, I told you! <laughs> but we purposely, my, my thought in doing this was, Let's not dumb anything down. Let's not shoot so everyone understands what we're doing. Let's do what you do if you want your kids to learn and, and read and such. You read slightly over their head and make them jump up for it. So we threw in, knowing Americans are very weak in history, we threw in tons of historical references to things. And people would come up afterwards and say things like, one girl said, that really disturbed me. I said, why? 
He says, well, I could tell you were trying to get us to think, but you weren't telling us how. And I said, exactly. That was the point. You know, I, I, I wasn't trying to simply convert people. I was first, my feeling is, is before anyone can think about something like the gospel, you have to first be able to think. And we live in a time of such distraction and such that I felt with this particular piece, yeah, there's something going on in it that I think would, you know, when, when we did this for Christians, they could kind of see something Christian going on. But that was, the, wasn't really the point. The point was really to puzzle people into thinking. And so uh, when we did this at this classical Christian academy in, uh, for high school students in Ro- Rochester, uh, Minnesota, the kids all just sat there afterwards, like, had no idea what was happening. And then they just started all raising their hands, going, what was that thing there? And what was that thing there? And I was just like, great. But actually, the questions happened in, in a totally secular environment in the University of Chicago, too. It wasn't, you know, it was just like people were, like, puzzled by what we were doing. And I consider, and, but they enjoyed it. They, they could feel that there was a narrative. This was uh, from a shadow puppet my friend Karsten did. And these were Nimrod's dreams. And the subject of the dreams was about the nature of language. That's what Karsten was doing. And, so, uh, and, and we just kind of tacked all this together, all this series of stuff. So much was going on, people would be wondering. One person came up and says, it's so glad, I'm so glad to see something that's not digital. You know, Another girl in Oregon came up to us afterwards and said, I didn't know you could do that with puppets. I'm going home tonight and start working on them. <laughs> just like, and I and I and I kicked myself for not having gotten some information, just so I could get in touch with her again and say, well, "How are you doing with that?" You know. Uh, so there's our Empire State Building, another tower. This is our final tower, and this is the uh, the four of us who were on the trip um, and uh, playing with toys, essentially. So essentially, what we see, just kind of wrapping it up here, is that. What I've come to understand is that puppetry is an amazing art form that can do quite a bit. Much more than most people have any conception of. It's like when you start putting this all together, you start realizing, wow, this is a, an American woman. Actually, no, I take it back. She's Canadian from the early part of the 20th century. And uh, very delicate puppet work. Or this is a, a strange creature that was actually an automaton. That is, a, an automaton is kind of like a puppet, that is a wind-up thing that goes over and over. But this is called the automaton chess player, or the Turk. And before the show, they would always go and open up all the cabinets and show people that there was nobody in there. And then he would play. And he played Ben Franklin and won. And he played Napoleon and won. And Napoleon was so mad, he just knocked all the chess pieces off. But in fact, the automaton chess player was a puppet because there was a very midgetoid person inside there who was also an extremely gifted chess player and that was always the secret <laughs> so uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, quite fascinating of course ventriloquism is puppetry and uh, ventriloquism is also, we were talking, some, some of us were talking about this the other day, one of the forms of puppetry that probably breeds the most, like, fear. <laughs> More horror films have been done about uh, ventriloquist dummies, because it's the whole thing of who's actually in control here. You know, there's just something about that. Uh, this is, uh, it, you find puppets also in pretty much every culture. This is actually something very rare in my area, uh, we have the Clinket Indians. This is a very rare example of Clinket puppetry. Unfortunately, no one in my town even knows anything about it. It was taken uh, and put in the museum, the Natural History Museum in New York. But you'll notice there's a thing inside of there that opens up and there's a face inside. This is actually constructed of bone and sinew. So, you know, you find puppetry all over the world doing all sorts of very interesting things. This is from Africa, a mask. Interestingly enough, I mean, you ask, what is the origin of puppetry? Well, the origin of puppetry goes back to the origin of a lot of imagery, which is to say, into the religious realm. In some ways, they were used as uh, idols. That is to say, in some c- cultures, you know, there would be the priest who would manipulate these things. And in fact, in the church, sometimes there were living statues and such done on the same sort of principle. 
Uh, there's something about puppets, uh, the way someone expressed it to me, is you can't really read them the way you can read, say, a human face. And so it breeds a certain sort of mystery. There's also a comic part of them. They're also related on another side to dolls and toys. And so one definition of puppetry, the difference between a puppet and a doll or a toy, is the doll or the toy you play with in your own private fantasy world. But as soon as you turn it around and start playing for somebody else, then it's a puppet. So this is an African mask, which is uh, uh, part of a puppet show, which is still used in certain religious ceremonies, particularly in Mali. Uh, this is Indonesian uh, shadow puppetry, uh, which is also based on very similar uh, Chinese shadow puppetry, which is actually more spectacular, but I don't have a picture of it here. But also used very much for religious reasons in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And they often do eight-hour puppet shows that people will sit through with the gamelan music and such. They're quite quite interesting. In fact, in Indonesia, there was a... I'd heard that for a while there was a, a whole television channel that did nothing but show uh, puppetry. This is Bunraku in Japan, which is probably the most complex puppetry on Earth. Um, the man standing behind it is one of three operators for the single puppet. Uh, he's, he is in, His face is emotionless the whole time. Uh, while he's holding this puppet, there may be another man next to him also holding a puppet, but everything goes into the puppet. There's also one figure, uh, you probably can't make it out, there's a kind of a shadow of a person who operates, he operates the right hand and the head. The other person operates the left hand and the torso, and the third person moves the legs. And to graduate from the leg to the head takes something like 25 years. And that's how complicated these things are to learn. In New York City, I saw this. Vietnamese water puppets, which actually come out of the water. And they have a screen, and they have these very long poles with these long mechanisms, and they come and they do all of these strange things. But it's puppetry performed in water. What I love about puppetry also is it can totally <laughs> violate any notion of the proscenium arch. You know, that... that kind of rectangle that we find in movie theaters as well as theater. And so uh, I've actually thought, based on the book Dialogki principle of adapting movies, to do a, a, a Tarkovsky adaptation of Stalker, the movie Stalker, where the, he's throwing the nut trying to get to the zone and just do it outside in the wilderness. No theater at all. Because that's puppetry can do that sort of thing. It can raise all sorts of questions, not only about the uh, ideas, but also about the nature of the material world itself. This is sand puppetry, in a sense, <laughs> done by a Czech. Uh, but the Ukrainians actually get into this sort of sand stuff. Uh, this is uh, also, you can obviously make puppetry out of pretty much anything. One, I think one of the big revelations to me is that the grammar of puppetry has expanded from being just little homunculi, homunculi and animal creatures to pretty much anything you can imagine made out of any material or any object. So the, the grammar is anything that you can move practically, which to me uh, is one of the things that makes it fresh. This is actually an automaton uh, from Europe. and But you could include an automaton. For instance, she plays the piano. She really plays uh, some sort of musical instrument here. But you could put this as part of a character in a puppet play, and you'd never know the difference in terms of who's a character and who's not. This also is kind of a puppet as well. And of course, you see here puppets. Now, this to me would be a great toy to have as opposed to some of the big-eyed, <coughs> stuffy little plush creatures we have because there's a lot of character in there. And of course, the question I ask, yes, it must be real rabbit fur. And of course, puppetry can also hit the dark side of the spectrum. So it's not just funny little creatures and stuff. It can also raise all sorts of questions. These are some of the other students that I didn't see from uh, the Institute of uh, Marionettes, the International Institute of Marionettes in Charleville-Mézières. Uh, this is also a student wow. pr production. So just a wide variety of... It's almost what your imagination can conceive given the material nature of the world. And uh, this is actually a, a film of live puppets that a friend of mine down in Los Angeles made, uh, based again on Czech puppetry. She's got another one based on her grand, uh, kind of memoirs of her grandmother, which is one of the most touching marionette films I've ever seen. And uh, her name is Genevieve Anderson. And again, 
any kind of material you can imagine. This is obviously a found doll head, bunches of keys. What is that? Uh, is that spark plugs on the side? I don't know. And uh, finally, yeah, why not fire? <laughs> so essentially, um, you know, that's the world of puppetry. And what I wanted you to see is that the, the, what, one of the reasons that I really wanted to do this, to uh, explore this stuff and to then start doing it, is because as a Christian who has been studying, my, actually my main areas of study have been music and film. But I came to a conclusion back in the late 90s that film, uh, well, more, more importantly music, which had been so important in the 1960s, uh, where there was this hint that maybe, more than a hint, a statement that music would, would lead to uh, change in society, uh, revolution, uh, uh, a search for meaning, all of these things found in music. What I, what I discovered by the end of the 90s is music had become containment for many people. For most of us, music <coughs> is the thing you wear on your head. It's kind of your personal soundtrack. You, you go around, you, you're listening to stuff, um, and that's not about liberation. That's, that's not about freedom. That's about, uh, I don't know what, but it's certainly not, it doesn't liberate you. <coughs> I, what was interesting is while I was taking my puppet tour in... Oh, I know what I wanted to show. While I was taking my puppet tour in, 19, uh, in 2005, someone invited me to a rock club in Berlin, and there were three bands playing. And I think one was English and one was American. I can't remember what the third one was because I left before then. But I remember going there. Now, I've been to my share of rock clubs, you know. And the truth is, I just, you know was watching the bands playing and stuff, and, and everyone was standing doing exactly what you do at a rock club. If you came to stand around and be cool, you'd do that. And if you came to do this, you did that. And then you walked out. And I thought to myself, and everyone knows exactly how they're going to respond here, so there's nothing really happening. And I thought about all the puppet shows, I thought, and how I'd walk out my head going with ideas, and I said, puppetry, 21st century, and I remember having this moment in Salzburg. A lot of other things were happening in my life at that moment, because I just lost my job and such, but I'd just seen the Salzburg Marionette Theater, and I thought, well, they have a great technique, but they're playing it with pre-recorded music. In fact, I, I remember sitting there thinking like, wow, I wonder if puppetry could get to the point where the artists were as good as the Salzburg Marionette Theater, but as imaginative as Bukti Alodki. And I actually mentioned that to one of them, and he said, like, I don't think that's ever going to happen, he said, because to do what we do, you just have to be completely free of, of the, the more restrictions that the other art would place. But I'm not sure about that. So, any questions, thoughts?